He promised that those who live and those who believe in him will be saved and never die. Getting excited. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, there are a lot of humorous stories about St. Peter at the gates and uh, going to heaven. There's a ton of very, very funny stories. One of my favorite is about a couple who died in a car crash after having been married for 60 years. Now wait, this does get funny. That sounds tragic, but it does get funny. Trust me. So they had been in good health for the last 10 years, mainly due to the interest of her, uh, the wife's interest in health foods and exercise and all the things she could do to keep her husband healthy. So when they reached the gates of heaven, St. Peter took them to their mansion, which was decked out with a beautiful kitchen, a wonderful bathroom, and a spa, and they ooed and odd. The old man asked Peter, though, how much it was going to cost. It's free, Peter replied. This is heaven. Next, they went back to survey the championship golf course on the back of the home. They could play golf every day, and each week the course would change to become a new one. It represented the great golf courses of, heaven, of, of earth. The old man said, okay, fine, but what are the greens fees? Peter said, this is heaven. You play for free. Next, they went to the clubhouse and saw the lavish buffet lunch with the cuisines of all the world laid out in front of them. And of course, the man says, how much? Peter says, you don't understand. This is heaven. It's free. Well, where are the low fat and low cholesterol tables? He asked. Peter lectured. That's the best part. You can eat as much of anything as you want. Whatever you want. It's all good and it's all free. And you never put on weight and you never get sick. This is heaven. With that, the old man went into a fit of anger, and he, throwing down his hat and stomping on it and streaking wildly, Peter tried to calm him down and ask, what, what is wrong? The old man looked at his wife and said, this is your fault. If it weren't for the blasted bran muffins and low-fat yogurt, I could have been here 10 years ago. Could have been here 10 years ago. But people often say, Ooh, what, what does heaven look like? What is heaven like? The Old Testament today that Paula read really gives us a hint. I guess there are people here within, within um, our, our virtual group, and maybe you too, who like shopping, and there are those who don't. It's cheap. They go window shopping. Remember the old downtown Eau Claire and how easy it was to go window shopping from here to there? Still remember crazy days in downtown Eau Claire. But you go window shopping, it's cheap, you know, and, and you can dream about anything you want. And you look at the shop windows and maybe you might stop and see a display of clothing and jewelry thinking, would that really, you would like, really like to have that, but you know full well that it's more than you can afford. Perhaps you've looked in a window of a travel agency and you've seen an advertisement for a holiday that you always wanted to go on. My dream vacation, I would love to go on a train trip from Chicago up to uh, uh, Glacier National Park. That would be so much fun. But I can't afford it. So I put the idea out of my head. When we can't afford things, we put the idea out of our head. As we read this text from Revelation today, it's as if we are window shopping and pressing our noses up against the window, looking at the wonderful scene in front of us. For instance, it's only a small glimpse of the beautiful necklace or watches or brooches and rings that are inside the shop. What we see as we look through this window in the book of Revelation is just a small, very small, tiny peek at what heaven's like. As you look through the windows in the book of Revelation, what is it that impresses you the most? Is it the enormous crowds? Revelation chapter 7. 
I looked and behold a great multitude, which no man could number, out of every nation and of all tribes, perhaps peoples and languages, here, before the throne of the Lord, before the throne of the Lamb, we see a mass of people. A mass of people, untouched by racism, sexism, nationalism, unit, unitism, or whatever the ism is you want to talk about. And that, my friends, is unique indeed. A crowd whose numbers defy calculations. This is one of those uncomfortable, or this isn't one of those uncomfortable crowds. People shoving and pushing and jamming together being rude, and some stepping on others' toes. Those gathered at the throne of God don't mind the crowd at all. In fact, they are happy to be part of it. They are happy to be so, a, a group of so many people who are praising and worshiping God. In this crowd are people from every nation, from every tribe and language. They understand one another perfectly. They are not divided into cliques, clusters, political groups, special interest groups, they are all friends. They don't exclude some because he, she is different or strange or appears to have behaved strangely. They are totally one group. You may remember apartheid. In the fight against apartheid in South Africa, Bishop Desmond Tutu often referred to this vision as God's victorious, liberated people being one people, free of everything that separates one person from another. Wouldn't it be great if we could just be in that reality right now in, in our world? Wouldn't it be great if we could be doing that? Just think of the changes that would happen if everybody could experience oneness in the everyday dealing of one person towards another, one nation towards another. Or, as you look through this window into heaven, perhaps you are impressed by the setting of the magnificent scene. Here is the huge crowd of people standing before the throne of God in the presence of the Almighty. But not only are there people, but there are also angels angels and other heavenly creatures. Imagine yourself and, and those whom you love in, in that crowd. Imagine them being in that crowd face to face with Christ, the risen triumphant Lamb who has taken away the sin of the world. Every person in that crowd is evidence that Jesus Christ is indeed the totally successful Savior of all people, regardless of race, nation, or language. He promised that those who live and those who believe in him will be saved and never die. Getting excited. This scene before the throne of God is proof that he has kept his promise. The blood of the lamb who was sanctified for all people, sacrificed for all people, has cleansed this vast crowd. Revelation says there was a great multitude which no man could count the number of from every nation. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, died to make them clean, to make them holy. As Isaiah says, through your sin, though your sin be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It is only because the Lamb gave us his life. He gave the life for those in that crowd that they are able to stand in the presence of God. That is the only reason. Or... Maybe when you look through the window into heaven, perhaps you are impressed by what is happening in this heavenly scene. Those before the throne aren't rushing about. They are in the presence of the Almighty, but they aren't interested in making a good impression, nor are they one bit nervous. They aren't concerned about the future. As they happily engage in worship, they call out in verse 10, Salvation be to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. And then the angel and the elders still join together in one thunderous chorus, a praise, of, a praise saying, Amen. Blessed glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. I would love to hear that amen. This sevenfold hymn of praise and joy, what I just said, blessed glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might, this sevenfold hymn of praise and joy indicates that there is nothing, 
nothing at all in creation that can match our God. All things belong to God, and God has accomplished all things for the salvation of all people. Paul says in Romans chapter 11, For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. The crowd around the throne can do nothing else but join together in a chorus of praise for everything that the Lamb has done for them. What a magnificent scene! But even more so when we ask the question as the Apostle John did, verse 13, these who are arrayed in white robes, who are they? And from where do they come? They're not people who have drifted through the years in spiritual ease, untouched by pain. Let me say that again. They are not people who have drifted through the years in spiritual ease, untouched by pain, untouched by sorrow. They are people who have gone through great ordeals that include tension, afflictions, stresses, troubles, and the testing which Christian experiences because they are followers of the Lamb. At times, the ordeal became too much for them. The enemy was too strong. Their affliction too over overpowering. It was only with Jesus Christ, the shepherd, that they have been victorious. Only because of the grace that God has shown through the Lamb that they are now able to stand before the throne of God. We all know people who have gone through these things. They no longer live in fear. They no longer live in illness. They no longer live in want. No hunger, no thirst, no want or poverty, no hurt or sorrow will bother them again. God is there. He is their good shepherd who will guard and protect them from all danger. Revelation chapter, Revelation goes on to say 15 and 17. He who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will never be hungry, neither thirsty anymore. Neither will the sun beat on them, neither any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne shepherds them and leads them to springs of water of life. And God will wipe away every tear. When we think of those we love, who are no longer with us. We miss them. Like I was telling Bob, when we think that they are not with us, we miss them. But when we think that they are part of that enormous crowd, then that comforts us. It's hard to be sad for them. They are enjoying the place where there is no more tears and there is no more pain and there is no more illness and there is no more suffering and there is no more dying. The only sadness really is for us who aren't there yet. And for us in our own lives, it does make a difference to know that that is waiting for us at the appropriate future time. That is what our faith looks forward to it is the ultimate for us in our times of trouble and affliction. When we go through our own personal times of ordeal, we have the assurance that the loving shepherd will walk with us as we cross the peaks and go down into the valleys during the journey through life. Verse 17, the lamb shepherds them and leads them to the springs of water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. A Christian is a person who values what they have and experience now. A Christian is a person who is unafraid of what lies ahead because of both of those. God is there. I don't know about you, but this little glimpse into heaven, it's amazing. I don't understand why people want to shun away from the book of Revelation because it is so amazing. This isn't a psychological escape or a hallucinatory lift from troubles. This is a God-given insight into a glorious new reality planned, prepared, reserved, and guaranteed for you and for me by the mercy, by the merciful Father, a risen, risen victorious Savior, and all accomplishing saints. What is wonderful, glorious tomorrow for all those who put their faith in Christ. That's what we await. What a wonderful gift. 
It comes down to this. Either we believe that with our last breath comes the end to us, the big full stop which shuts the doors and everything beyond life, or that death is going back to the one who created us. Jesus promised that death doesn't have to be the last laugh. Death doesn't get the last laugh. Satan doesn't get the last laugh. The words of Jesus comfort us in our times. As you go through difficulties, I want you to remember this. What did Jesus say in John chapter 14, verse 2? I am going to prepare a place for you. How many times has God broken a promise? How many times did Jesus break a promise? Never. And so rest in the sure and certain hope that one day we will be standing with our loved ones in the midst of that crowd. Why? Because Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you and for me. May we take comfort in that and celebrate in the saints who are there. May that feeling overshadow our losses, our feeling of loss. May our feelings of loss and missing people turn into joy. That they're, they're there right now. Right now. Amen. Now may the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.